Good evening. This is Minnie Brussel in Carmel, California. It's broadcast number 532, February the 14th, 1982. Just for a little light side as an introduction, and I hope while I'm doing this first article or series of articles to share with you, you get a pencil like I suggested last week to take down some names because I'm going into a lot of details, and uh, if you have a few of the names, you can watch them in the news in the weeks to come. Back in January, a few weeks ago, I had on broadcast number 529 the quotation of part of a book of Maxine Cheshire. It's called Maxine Cheshire Reporter, where she described members of Henry Kissinger's staff. You might remember this broadcast. One particular, John Lehman, he's a cousin of Princess Grace of Monaco, and I mentioned how he gave parties in Washington, D.C. for the top admirals and members, as I said, of Kissinger's staff. Uh, John Lehman uh, had these San Pantalon parties. The women came dressed and the men just wore their naval suits or their shirts and nothing down below. And one of the most important guests I mentioned was Admiral Rembrandt Robinson, who was Henry Kissinger's liaison with the Chief of Naval Operations. And Admiral Moore was also there with gold braid, uh, respond with gold braid and on his shirt and trimmed with ruffles and so forth. Uh, to follow up on that little item that uh, Maxine wrote about in 1978 about John Lehman, the host, who is, as I say, the cousin of Princess Grace, there was an article in the Houston Post, January the 12th, 1982, just this last month, that Senator John Tower of Texas, who's the head of the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, Senator John Tower was promoted to Senior Chief Boatswain of the U.S. Naval Reserve. And the Houston Post said that Tower is the only enlisted military reservist in Congress. Navy Secretary John Lehman, the same gentleman who hosted these parties for the top admirals and Henry Kissinger's gang, attended the presentation. And the article goes on to say Tower is chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And, of course, many times I've mentioned on this broadcast that Tower's wife is the sister of Samuel Cummings from Philadelphia of the CIA, who's in London, the fellow that helped arm Idi Amin and Gaddafi and works with Edwin Wilson and Frank Turple and so forth. Uh, John Lehman is the cousin of Princess Grace, and he was down in Texas to honor John Tower for... Uh, being promoted to the chief boatswain of the U.S. Naval Reserve. Well, this month in We Magazine, February 1982, there's an item by Robin Moore. He's been always connected with the CIA. He wrote The French Connection, The Happy Hooker, The Green Berets. And it's an article on Dallas's swinging trisexuals. And he goes in to the uh, homosexuals in Dallas, Texas, and the wild parties down there. And he refers to the uh, queens, the, the homosexual queens and the lesbians, and then the tries, the T-R-I sexuals, who just about try anything. I guess it's try three ways and also T-R-Y. And, and Robin Moore defines it. Well, you can imagine what he means by try. The article is about this Dallas-Fort Worth area being the swinging a city in America and the homosexual queen at the Fort Worth Country Club, the Shady Oaks Country Club in Fort Worth. And then he goes on to say that it is interesting to note that the top aide to one of the most important men in Congress of the USA is enjoying a remarkably close relationship with his employer and one of the highest-ranking military reservists, thanks to this legislature in the state of Texas, who is one of the most prominent members of the limberistic community. So what Robin Moore is referring to in Texas is Senator John Tower, who he uh, suggests is very much part of this swinging sex group down in uh, Texas at the present time. He refers to him as the high-ranking naval reservist in Texas. And the Houston Post tells about the dinner that uh, John Lehman, Lehman attends. And he's presently Navy secretary. So the moral majority that put Ronald Reagan in must enjoy the tangled web of the high society of Princess Grace and Senator John Tower and the sexual feats that are even been written up in Wee Magazine. I thought that was pretty funny. For all the fuss they make, the moral majority that put Reagan into power, 
Uh, maybe they should look into the Navy Secretary and John Tower and Samuel Cummings and that gang that are causing so much trouble around the world in other operations such as arming Carlos and these various countries where they have produced evidence of blowing up planes, killing, torture, and so forth. Uh, there's more to the high Navy um, aristocracy, if you would call it, the high society in Washington and the same characters that Maxine was writing about a while ago are now being written up in We Magazine just this month. Last week I did part two on Fritz Kramer because I've gotten requests to talk about Fritz Kramer and I think instead of doing one evening that somebody might miss because he's so important, I'm going to do a continuing series maybe about five minutes each week or ten minutes on the importance of Fritz Kramer. I mentioned last week that he's the godfather of Alexander Haig and Henry Kissinger. Now I don't have to go into the plans to surround Cuba, to make war in El Salvador, to uh, pressure the Polish people into a war with the Soviet Union. Alexander Haig and Henry Kissinger uh, have to be examined more closely for the foreign policies they gave us in Southeast Asia, in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, the Middle East, Central America, South America. Kissinger was helping ITT with the orders to kill Salvador Allende. Uh, who are these people and who is Fritz Kramer? I mentioned last week that Fritz Kramer's mother was part of the chemical dyes and paraffin group, that's IG Farben in Germany. And I didn't mention last week that his father is a nobility. Again, the effort to put the royal families onto the thrones in Europe once they defeat the Soviet Union. Hopefully this has been their goal uh, continuously since the Russian Revolution in 1918-1919. Well, Fritz Kramer has an interesting background, and I want to mention a little more about him and his relationship to Henry Kissinger uh, right now. So part of the references I have here come from a New York Times article that was sent to me, and I gave you the references on that last week. And then I have two other books. I have many books on Henry Kissinger, but I want to excerpt a few of those of his relationship to Fritz Kramer. Now, Fritz Kramer was uh, living in Germany with his mother. He went to school in London, Switzerland, and Germany. He was married in Weisbaden, Germany, to a Swedish woman, they moved to London where she could have her son, Sven, S-V-E-N, Kramer, who then came later to Harvard, who was a uh, studying his doctor's degree under Henry K Kissinger, and then went to the National Security Council, where I believe he is today. Uh, they had their son in England, so the father was German, the mother was Swedish, and the son was British. They mo he moved to Rome. Uh, they lived there for a while under Mussolini when Mussolini came to power and was making his pacts with Adolf Hitler. And when the Nazis invaded Poland about the beginning of World War II, uh, Kramer's wife and the son, the small son, went to his mother in Weisbaden, Germany, and lived with them through the entire war. Now, Mrs. Kramer had two sons. One of them was Dr. William Kramer who went to England and he was interned in Great Britain and suspected of being a German spy, a Prussian spy during World War II. How did the British get so smart? Dr. Fritz Kramer, the brother, went to the United States and began working immediately for the United States Army where he would be recruiting Henry Kissinger in 1943 when Kissinger got out of high school. He came over here in 1939 from Germany, went to high school and then went into the army in 1943 down in Louisiana where Fritz Kramer who was from Germany whose family was living in Germany the war was going on recruited Henry Kissinger Henry Kissinger entered the army as I say in 43 he was working for United States Army Intelligence he had just been over here from Germany a few years he was sent to Clamp, Camp Claiborne in Louisiana where according to this one book Kissinger the uses of power he met an individual who would change his life he changed his life and he changed our life in many ways. Fritz Kramer was dressed as a private in the U.S. Army. He was 16 years older than Henry Kissinger. He came into the United States. He had a degree in law from Germany, a degree in political science. And he comes to the United States Army, working for the United States Army and recruiting Kissinger from Army Intelligence while the war is going on in 1943 and his wife and uh, parents, father and mother, are in Nazi Germany, and the family money is coming from I.G. Farben, and the father is a Prussian nobility in living in Germany in Weisbaden. 
The impact of Kramer's acquaintance with Kissinger, according to this book, Kissinger Uses of Power, would be gigantic, and the effects would be lasting. Kramer approached the commanding general of the 84th Division, and he was traveling around giving lectures to the United States Army on why we were at war with Nazis, if you can believe that, with his thick German accent. And Henry Kissinger was handpicked by him to go with him to Europe, and they went to Germany in 1945, just as the war was winding down. After the war, Kramer got Kissinger a job as an instructor at the Army Training School. This is 1945 to 46 at $10,000 a year. This young Prussian who was in intelligence with his thick German accent, and how would Mr. Uh, Kramer, his brother was interred at Great Britain, what power did he have to get Kissinger a job in the U.S. Army? We were uh, going into Germany. The war was over. His mother and father lived in Nazi Germany. His son was there during this entire time. And then he tells the United States Army, give Henry 10000 a year, which he got that one year. Now, later, Henry Kissinger goes on, and his claim to fame was to influence uh, General Cretan Abrams. Remember the Cretan who carried on the war in Southeast Asia? Secretary of Defense James Schlesinger, General Vernon Walters, Deputy Director of the CIA, who carried on the bloodbath not only in Southeast Asia but in Chile, Secretary of Army Robert Froelich, Helmut Sonnefeld, who was the counselor to Henry Kissinger, and General Alexander Haig. These were to be the protégés of uh, Kramer, who influenced Kissinger, and then Kissinger would carry on the influence. These are people that Kramer's life directly affected. Kissinger gave up that Army job after one year in 1946 and went directly to Harvard University, where he found a patron named William Yandel Elliott, a staunch anti-communist, a violent anti-communist. It's one year. The war is over. He stayed at Harvard about 20 years, but in 1951, that's just shortly after he was at Harvard, he started there in 1946, did his undergraduate work and continued. 1951, Henry Kissinger did his first cloak and dagger work for the CIA, and it was set up by Elliott. He began to work for the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Friends of the Middle East, which was a violently anti-Semitic front working with Arabs and the John Connolly and the Texas oil people, and he was a consultant to the Operation Research Office in Washington, D.C., Kramer was 35 years old when, uh, there's a description of Fritz Kramer in a book about Henry Kissinger. He was 35 years old and a devout Christian and the son. One book says a Ruhr businessman. Another book says Prussian nobility. Uh, the noble Prussian stock. He had been in law school. He became a leader in the United States Army, Army Intelligence, after his two PhDs in Rome and Germany and comes to the United States. And as I say, of May 43, he meets Private Kissinger. He takes him uh, to Europe with him, gets him a job, and tells him, don't go to any ordinary school. Go to Harvard. And he does. He goes to Harvard. In, and in the early 60s, Fritz Kramer's son, Sven, who lived in Nazi Germany during the war, wrote his senior honors thesis under Henry Kissinger's direction, earned a doctorate in political philosophy at the University of California in Berkeley, and Sven then joined the National Security Council in the Lyndon Johnson administration. In 1967, he became the aide to General Alexander Haig. This is Mr. Kramer's son, Fritz Kramer, be, who handpicked Kissinger. His son then comes here and becomes the aide to Haig. And Haig at the time was Kissinger's deputy. Among those who recommended Haig for that job was Fritz Kramer, who worked with Haig at the Pentagon in the early 60s. That's through the John Kennedy assassination, the U-2 uh, flight in the Soviet Union that broke up the peace talks and so forth. Another book of Henry Kissinger describes how when he was sworn in to become Secretary of State or National Security Advisor under uh, Richard Nixon, Ehrlichman had left and Haldeman had left, and he was sworn in that his family came to this ceremony, of course. There was Fritz Kramer attended, Nelson Rockefeller attended, and Paula Kissinger, the mother of Henry Kissinger, held the New Testament on which her son was sworn in. They could have had an Old Testament that was available, but all this BS of Kissinger being a Jew, there is the thing about his returning to Germany or his feeling about the Jews or the Nazis that indicates 
a thing at all about his having any feelings towards Jews or being Jewish. I think that that Kissinger story of being Jewish is one of the biggest frauds to come down the turnpike. Another uh, book on Henry Kissinger has a quotation of Fritz Kramer. He said, Kissinger is totally objective. You can see this in Israel. I don't think he has any interest in three million Jews who will be killed if Israel goes back to the 1967 borders. This is a man who does a job. He is a modern man. A modern man is somebody who doesn't give a hoot about his background. Rabbi Silver, uh, son of the late Zionist leader Abba Silver, said, Could Mr. Kissinger see the destruction of Israel? Yes, he knows that that could happen. Israel's destruction might give him pause for a night or become a paragraph in a book. But he recognizes that in the real world, size counts and power counts, and that small nations often are erased. He might not like to have it happen, but he would say the world has no guarantees for anyone. Israel may disappear, and the United States will ultimately disappear. And there's another quotation, a former National Security Council aide that says he avoids framing a policy on, towards Israel on moral grounds. Instead, he looks at the self-interest of nations. This is the Kissinger, uh, uh, finally a quotation, the protege of Fritz Kramer, who in 1972, at the time of Watergate, where so many people were leaving the office and Kissinger was taking over with uh, Richard Nixon, he said, the illegal work we have to do, we do immediately. The unconstitutional takes a little longer. And later, he, uh, the truth came out about secretly bombing Vietnam and Cambodia that Congress didn't know about, the wiretaps we didn't know, and the plumbers and the dirty work that they were doing right up to their arrest at the Watergate Hotel. Well, that is the protege of Fritz Kramer. Fritz Kramer is still in the Pentagon, and it's a disgusting example of just overt nonchalance and indifference to what America stands for. And uh, as he says, America may disappear and Israel di will disappear, and uh, it doesn't really matter. I read a book almost in one day this week. It's a book by Sigrid Schultz called Germany Will Try It Again. She's a newspaper woman that was stuck in Germany during the last war and studied very carefully the rise of Nazism from World War I to World War II. And in 1944, she published a book saying that there were secret general staffs, that there were meetings step by step that they were building up and the same organization that made World War II possible, and it was, was just a year from being over when she wrote this book, even before it was over, they were trying again. The same preparations are going on now for the revival of German military ambition after the present war is lost. This was published by Reynolds and Hitchcock, 1944, a woman warning in 1944. And I remember 1943 is when Kramer is... Uh, taking Henry Kissinger from Army Intelligence. He himself is in the U.S. Army, and then they go right into Germany as soon as the war was over and begin their tricks. Now, I got a call from a subscriber to these tapes, and I'll always answer your questions. If you write, it takes me longer to answer. If you call me, I'm as near as the phone usually I can uh, get to you. You can get to me, rather. And I got a call uh, from somebody who was always talking about the Trilateral Commission, People are concerned that Henry Kissinger and Alexander Haig represent the Rockefellers. If you read the book, uh, Martin Borman, Nazi in Exile, that new one by Manning, and you study the situation, uh, you almost have to come to the conclusion, or at least I have come to it, is that this country is a captured nation, that I.G. Farben and the 700 or 500 corporations that they set up have already taken major control of this country, of the news media, of the film studios, of the means of transportation and utilities and so forth and minerals and that they're closing in now the effort of all their work from say the end of world war ii is beginning to appear and show up now and people like alexander haig are making decisions uh... violent outrageous decisions almost of a person of a mental sickness but it's a religious fervor that has come from being indoctrinated by fritz kramer and these people uh, who have taken the Kissingers and Hagues and pushed them to the brink of what most of the world would really believe is insanity, if you could even go into their heads half the time. 
There's a long article in the Washington Post this week, Soviet gas pipeline to benefit multinational oil companies. And it talks about Exxon and Shell and Mobil and Texaco and how all the Western nations would benefit by those gas pipelines. But Henry Kissinger is pushing us to the brink of uh, trying to get us to stop having that trade. Now, if he worked, if Kissinger and Haig worked for the Rockefellers, they could have sent in troops to keep the Shah of Iran in power. They could have sent in troops down uh, to keep Somoza in power because Jimmy Carter was part of the Trilateral Commission. But if the Nazis that retrench, that reorganize, control the Rockefellers and the Haigs and Kissingers, then they don't care whether they build the gas lines or business is good or the Western banks go broke, bailing out Poland. They will bankrupt us and the taxpayers for billions of dollars. The goal of stirring up the trouble right now against uh, Poland is to keep that gas line from going, keep the West from trading with the Soviet Union, stop us from getting along, stop us from being dependent upon each other and encouraging the weapons and the missiles and the rockets or testing the atomic bombs. There's an article this week in the paper about the conflict of Alexander Haig and Mr. Weinberger and how Haig would like to drop a bomb and just to show the Soviet Union how we can do it now as if it's different from Hiroshima or how he would send troops to El Salvador and even Casper Weinberger is saying hold back. Weinberger representing even corporations like Bechtel or business corporations that, that can trade back and forth and a war cuts off all trade and Henry Kissinger, the protege of Kramer, uh, Alexander Haig, the Secretary of State and Kissinger right behind him talking all the time to Richard Nixon and uh, Nixon, of course, had strong debts to these Nazis that put him into power. I feel that, that the conflicts that are going on in most of the things that you read in your front page today are the result of being a captive nation, and until we realize that, there's no solution to the individual problems that we're screaming and yelling about all the time. Now, I'm going back. I didn't think I'd spend so much time on Air Florida, but I have to continue with that because I still feel that is the biggest story in the country just as in 1979 when Edwin Wilson uh, was exposed or Frank Turpel and George Kirk Cola were arrested in New York City. There's something about the Air Florida crash that is very complicated and while most news stories just pass over certain aspects of it, I must continue that with you because it has interconnecting links and it's affecting uh, a lot of people, it's touching a lot of bases, and I feel it's going to spread out, and it's a symptom of something very big, so I'm going to continue. This is actually part four of the Air Florida story, what's new this week on Air Florida. I'm just going to do the highlight stories that bring out new information. The first one was from the Washington Post, February the 6th. Uh, I'm saying new this week because my posts come a week late, so we get this a week later. There's a long story, Be Cautious About the Crash Verdict. This is 24 days later, and the article says, We have found cockpit voice recorder transcripts have been taken out of context sometimes, and the absence of other evidence, we produce misleading and erroneous impressions as to the actual accident. Sometimes there's pilot error as opposed to faulty equipment or procedures. We blame the pilot. And this has already emerged as a major question in the investigation. The causes of the crash remain unknown. Now, one of the pilots for the Air Florida that was killed flew Air Sunshine before joining Air Florida in 1978, but co-pilot Roger Pettit was hired directly from the U.S. Air Force, which was interesting because I'm still thinking of some way of mind control where they were unable to do anything but just take off knowing the plane was faulty. This article said by the time Flight 90 was lined up on the field, they were told to move quickly, which I mentioned last week because another plane was there. But while on the run runway, the transcript indicates that the Air Florida crew detected problems. They recognized, and it's evident from everything I've seen so far, that there were problems, but they were told you've got to move anyway, and they took those orders uh, from the tower. Another article in the Washington Post says the crash of Flight 90 looks more and more like a classic plane accident, the experts feel. A number of factors, long recognized problems, any one of three or four could have caused this problem. And they list them such as snow and ice on the wings and the history of 737's takeoff, which hasn't given problems before or after. 
And they mentioned the engine instrument sensors may have misled the crew. And this is one of the problems. And they, this article goes into the assuming that there's no mechanical failures, the responsibility would be with the pilots, but the engine instrument sensors may have misled them. There are three instruments in the engine that tell a pilot to suspect engine performance. The air traffic controllers cleared them. They were the 16th plane to take off after the snow was plowed away. No problems for other pilots before or after. After Flight 90 faltered, when it went down the runway, the pilot seemed as if he was trying to abort the takeoff. The runway seemed perfectly safe, so two different articles suggest that they detected problems, they wanted to abort it, but they were unable, they were told, get going. Now, an interesting article, which I briefly went into uh, as to passengers on the plane, because I didn't know how important it was in the beginning, was the one on the eight people from uh, Fairchild being on the aeroplane. I went into Mr. Tirado, who worked for George Bush, uh, who was former director of the CIA. But there's another story in the Washington Post. Right after the accident, eight middle management executives and engineers from Fairchild were on the plane. One survived and seven died. They were heading for Tampa, Florida, facil the facilities down there of Honeywell Corporation for potential subcontractor or supplier. Now, I asked for information about Honeywell, and I've gotten some from listeners, and it's terribly important uh, to a piece of the puzzle. I'm not, I can't tell you what it is now. But they were headed down to the Honeywell people, and these were very important uh, people. All of them worked in Germantown, which is a good name for Fairchild, space and electronics, satellite and space communications. One of them who died, Mr. Smolin, was the manager of quality control at Fairchild. Mr. Coffin was senior management engineer. Mr. Carluccio was manager of the production control. Levinson was test engineering in charge of. Robert Londini was director of procurement, and Robert Trexler was manager of test operations. According to the Washington Post, they were very big, basically very big people. Seven killed at one time from Fairchild on the way down to Honeywell to meet down there. I did get some information on Honeywell that I can share with you now, and this came out of Minnesota. Uh, Honeywell manufactures that alarm system in Colorado for the U.S. Air Force that tells us whether quickly to go to war or not. They're in charge of the North American Air Defense Command. It's made of Honeywell machinery, and they've put this together. I got another clipping from the same party, foreign firms in Minnesota, and it goes into the companies from Switzerland and Germany, West Germany, that control military contracts in Minnesota. And there was a meeting January 21st of this year, 1982. The Gray Flannel Hit Squad, the Pentagon's think tank, holds court in Bloomington, Indiana. And they were selling military hardware, the Red Menace Theory of International Diplomacy. Honeywell uh, contracts were 387794000 alone. Just last year, a list of control, uh, a conference on selling military hardware in Minneapolis alone. Uh, the, the Fairchild people were on the way to Florida to meet with the Honeywell people. Well, right after that accident, shortly afterwards, just in the past week or so, February the 5th, the president of Fairchild resigned very abruptly. John Dealey, D E L. D-E-A-L-Y, resigned abruptly as president and chief operating officer for Fairchild Industries, one of the largest corporations in Washington. He had 19 months to go on his job. He makes 160000 plus all the benefits. In a terse statement he, that admitted any words or praise or gratitude, according to the Washington Post, that accompanied this kind of work, he walked out. Seven people from that company, high-level people, were killed in one plane crash. And four days later, the president of the company walks out. By mutual agreement, he departed. The company won't discuss the reasons. He gave up his seat on the board. He severed all connections with Fairchild and its subsidiaries. And the company officials declined to answer. This is a company, Fairchild Revenues, makes $1.2 billion in the Washington, D.C. area. And they the American satellite subsidiary, the engineers for Fairchilds, 
are stationed in the Washington, D.C., in Germantown, and they're in partnership with Continental Telephone. His departure, according to the Washington Post, took Wall Street by surprise. And uh, they quoted a man, Wolfgang Demisch, if you needed some more German names in this, Wolfgang Demisch, D-E-M-I-S-C-H, who's an analyst with Morgan Stanley Company. I'm not sure if this is going to be well-received in Wall Street. Uh, there was some hint of missing money or troubles of profits falling off. And, of course, I've been watching these huge amounts of money uh, going $50 million and $60 million from various banks and countries. And Fairchild has been a cover or a front for CIA people, one in particular from the Nugent Hand Bank uh, in Southeast Asia. A large hunk of money that could have been used for espionage that could be linked, again, going back to that, Bank in Australia that I keep watching for signs of where that's going to surface is missing out of the Fairchild till. And the Wall Street Journal and Washington Post had an article. A Daly resigns as president of Fairchild, and that was just four days after seven of the top level management people were killed in a crash going down to Florida to meet with the Honeywell people. We'll take a one minute break and then go back some more to Air Florida and some more complicated threads the tangle in with this operation. I think it's important to follow this as it comes out. Even though there's important news in the story, I want to stay with this Air Florida flight. This concludes the first half. And now here's May with part two. Okay, we'll go on now and it gets a little complicated, so fair warning. After these seven people from Fairchild, top people, were killed in that crash, there uh, was the resignation of the president of Fairchild, abruptly unexpected, high-salaried person, been with the company 14 years, walked out, had, doesn't want any more to do with the company. And as I say, there was a quotation from an analyst with Morgan Stanley, who evidently handles the account of Fairchild. It's not going to be well received the way he walked out. Well, this, about three days after that article in the paper, uh, there was a obituary notice on Henry S. Morgan. He's old enough to die. We can't presume everybody is killed. But just coincidentally, Henry Sturgis Morgan is the great grand, he's the grandson, not the great grandson, he's the grandson of J. Pierport Morgan. And he was in banking, investment banking on Wall Street. Then he formed Morgan Stanley and Company, the same company that is complaining that carries the Fairchild. He was elected a director of General Electric Company in 1935 and stayed with them after the war. Of course, General Electric is the company that sponsored Ronald Reagan and touted him for president for years, touring all over the United States under General Electric Company. He served in the Navy in 1951. He became the director of Aetna Insurance Company. And Aetna Insurance Company is the company that Marvin Davis went to for money. Aetna has bought out... Marvin Davis bought 20th Century Fox on huge loans, and he bought Pebble Beach, our area up here. And then Aetna came in to bail him to put in uh, buildings or insurance companies out in L.A. and in Century City. So that Aetna was right behind Marvin Davis. And uh, this particular Henry Sturgis Morgan, the grandson of J. Pierpont Morgan, was involved with General Electric, Aetna Insurance, and he formed Morgan Stanley that handled the Fairchild business. And so all of these bases were brought out in that article, and he passed away three days after uh, this John F. Dealey, the president of Fairchild, resigned. Now, there was another article in the Wall Street Journal, January the 11th. W Western Airline expands its board to 15 people. And last week, I did quite a detailed broadcast on Mr. Neil Burke and how he came, took a trip around the world and came back with $50 million. His Alaska International Airline was the one that uh, supplied the transport plane, one of the three that Gaddafi got that was illegal to ship to Gaddafi. He'd gone to London, procured money to buy three of these transports, and one went to Miami and then off to Gaddafi. Uh, then he took this nice little trip and came back with $50 million to buy Wien Airlines in Alaska and then was going to turn Wien into Western. And as I mentioned last week, it was Air Florida that wanted to buy Western Airlines and put up the, uh, started the bidding or buying in June of 81. 
so that uh, Mr. Burt came back with this money and went to Western Airlines in October of 81 and said, I think I'll take over and be the board or chairman of Western Airlines, and December became the chairman and director without salary. And just two days before the Air Florida plane went into the water, he selected four new directors, and one of them was Fred Benninger, chairman and chief executive of MGM Grand Hotels. And now this gets a little more complicated. He also has North, uh, an officer from Northwest Energy Company he chose to be on the board, and another friend, George Suddick from Alaska National Insurance, and Roy Utter, a Western uh, airline pilot. So just two days before the Air Florida crash, and that company had never had a crash and wanted to buy Western, Fred Benninger, uh, chairman and chief executive of MGM was put on the board of Western. Now, the attorney for, uh, I have an interesting uh, series of articles about Mr. Benninger, and the attorney for um, MGM, Greg Boutzer, and a group of people who just made a shift in control of MGM. Along those lines, today, or this week rather, was an article, A New Head is Named at MGM Studio. There's a shift of positions of a lot of people. As I say, Air Florida in June 81 want uh, to buy Western Airlines. In July of 81, they had the simulated crash of that convent airplane on a bridge in the Potomac, five and a half miles south of where that went in. In September 81, Edward Acker, who uh, made Air Florida successful, left and went to Pan America, who was, they were losing money to Air Florida. Um, and then after the crash, well, just before the crash, and I figure this fits in, but I, it's very complicated, Bill Holden died in November of 1981, just before the first of the year, and Natalie Wood died in November 27, 1981, November 29th. Now, Holden was an international traveler, and I told you I do broadcast soon in the future on William Holden with his Swiss bank accounts. He was a partner with Mr. Khashoggi of Lockheed, of Saudi Arabia. Uh, they had uh, this compound in Kenya, the wild animal compound. Uh, he had a interesting life, this Bill Holden. He's traveled with Stephanie Powers, who makes the TV series Heart to Heart with Robert Wagner. Natalie Wood was working at MGM uh, when she died. They were in the middle of this film when she was killed. And there are many articles now coming out suggesting the evidence that uh, Thomas DeGucci in Los Angeles has died about the autopsy. And maybe you see on the newsstands articles that are beginning to seep out with more facts about her death. And the in between those time periods, and I'm going into the Air Florida story because on the board of Western Airlines that wanted to stop Air Florida from taking over Western, MGM enters the picture. Now, last week, February the 8th, Frank Rothman, a top lawyer for the entertainment industry, was made head of MGM. He's a close advisor to Kirk Kerkorian, who controls MGM, and he's now been made a chairman. Now, Kerkorian is one of these people who wanted to buy MGM. Mr. Bronfman of Seagram's Whiskey was chairman of the board. He wanted to control the studio. Kerkorian goes over to Germany, and I'll do more details on the minute, and picks up the money from London and Germany to plug down the cash to buy MGM uh, and have the controlling interest. Now, Mr. Rothman, this last week, was shifted to be chairman of MGM, and he came from the law firm of Wyman, Boutzer, Cook, Kirkle, K-U-C-H-E-L, and Silbert. Uh, Boutzer, Greg Boutzer, was the attorney for Howard Hughes and has worked with the CIA all his life, and this same um, law office, Rothman, that just moved into MGM, is, represents American broadcasting system. If you ever listen to ABC, Hilly Rose in Los Angeles, or I uh, believe it's Ray Bream, or you listen to Owen Spann, or Ron Owens, or Jim Eason. If you ever wondered on KGO why you can't talk about Frank Turpel, or Edwin Wilson, or the Polish Pope, or the CIA, or any of the subjects we talk about here, if, we call, if I call KGO, they cut you off when Bob Trevor and I talked about these things. He was moved out of the newscasting and just does, he reads a news script. He can't have his talk show anymore. The head of a uh, lawyer for American Broadcasting Companies 
is the office of Greg Boucher of the CIA, the same attorney for the Howard Hughes people. So if you, there's no mystery into the long talk shows of ABC, uh, whether it's the Robert Hartman, the David Hartman show, Good Morning America, or any of those programs. The attorney for Kerkorian moved in to become head. And also, part of this corporation um, switch, it mentions in Los Angeles Times this week, Fred Benninger of uh, the Grand Ho MGM Grand Hotels and his role with the MGM Studios. And Benninger was put by Burke on the board of Western Airlines to salvage Western Airlines to keep Air Florida from taking control. Now, that Mr. Kirkorian story is a fascinating one. I have a book called Kirk... Kerkorian, uh, the American Dream. It's about the first tycoon of leisure, and this is hardly the American Dream. It's, it's it, the cover tells about the man from rags to riches who takes chances. In the early 50s, he accumulated his first million. A few years later, it was tens of million, and he went on to control Western Airlines and Metro Golden Mare uh, Studio. He put up his money today. He has over 100 million, according to this book that came out a few years ago. Now, when he wanted control of MGM, uh, he was competing with Bronfman for control, and he went to Greg Boutzer, the attorney for Howard Hughes, and then Krikorian goes off to London, and uh, he meets with the Warburgs over there and bankers in order to take control of MGM, and he has appointments there with a man from Jean-Louis de Gunsberg, a director of a banking firm of Burston in Texas, which is a London firm where the Texas National Bank of Commerce in Houston has 35% interest. And then they set him up with another person who uh, is Otto Schopler, S-C-H-O-E-P-P-L-E-R. And Schopler comes out of a firm called Bankhouse Burkhardt and Company, an old line banking firm in Essen, West Germany. And they speak to Kerkorian, and they immediately hand him $50 million to buy MGM. So you wonder, uh, where are these studios getting the money? Who's running this country? Who decides what films are made? Who in the heck are these people like Otto Schopler, uh, any more than we knew about Fritz Kramer, or the Bankhouse, Burghardt, and company? This one book on Kerkorian says, The speed with which he borrowed such sums inspired rumors the money came from mysterious sources such as syndicate money that went from Las Vegas to Switzerland, numbered Swiss accounts, or was it Bernie Cornfield, the magnet of overseas mutual funds, sharing his $1.8 billion assets, or was it Aristotle Onassis money? When they asked him where he got the money to buy this studio, he sought unsuccessfully to find out. He said Burkhold has his funds. It's a consentorium of European banks. His attorney, Gerald Schutzbank, S-C-H-U-T-Z-B-A-N-K, said Kerkorian never questions the source of the funds. His asking German bankers for the source of their funds would have been considered offensive. When they loan him money, he doesn't ask where they got it. Now, the reason this is important in terms of 1984 or control of our minds or the media or the films we see or what gets on ABC or any of the other stations is who are these people and what is their connection to the people from Nazi Germany, the IG, Farben, Combine, or Collection? How is it that they come in and then they get on the board of these uh, various organizations and the head of MGM Hotels gets on the board of directors of uh, Western Airlines two days before Air Florida crashes in Washington and Air Florida is trying to get control of Western Airlines. When you get a small company who's in business on their own trying to take a certain route, they don't stand a chance at all because in come these uh, big hunks of money and we don't know where they're coming from. Now, the important, uh, I don't want to complicate too much the connections of Aetna Insurance with the Morgans and with 20th Century Fox, except that they have put up a lot of money to bail out Marvin Davis. Evidently, he is a multimillionaire on his own, but there also is a lot of money behind him to come in that is linked to the Morgans or Fairchild to supply the funds he needed for the transaction of buying up the area in West Los Angeles, the Fox Studios, so that 
MGM is controlled by one faction. Gulf and Western owns Paramount. 20th Century Fox is owned by investment bankers of another sort. Whether it's Fairchild with their German connections, the aerospace industry, the studios uh, have always been controlled by certain large interests. Originally, they started as individual uh, families, the uh, Louis Mayer or the Warner family or Harry Cohn, but they've been taken over and the entertainment business is big business. Now, Natalie Wood worked for MGM. Uh, she was involved in a movie at the time that she died. The movie was a controversial one. The person that was making it with her, Cliff Robinson, had been fired uh, three years ago. He'd been blacklisted because he couldn't make a movie, and he had blown the whistle on Mr. Bagelman, who works at MGM, who was producing the picture, because he exposed a swindling and a large amount of money at the time, and they black Bagelman got a slap on the wrist and left one studio and went on off to MGM to work for Kikorian, and they were producing that movie, A Brainstorm, at the time that Natalie Wood died. Several articles, as I say, are on the stand about Natalie, and the reason I bring it up is that MGM is controlled by Kerkorian and Greg Bouncer of the CIA, and uh, the law they represent Rothman's offices, the American Broadcasting Company, and large corporations, Paramount Studio, and a lot of what goes in Hollywood, like the attorney for the Howard Hughes Empire. So when you work for these companies and you make trips, such as she did to the Soviet Union, or William Holden traveling up to planning his trip to Siberia, and they're traveling all over the world. Uh, they can be used for spying purposes, going back to Natalie's white Russian background, her anti-communist political feelings. And Natalie Wood's attorney, along with Robert Wagner, is Paul Ziffer, who's in the office of William French Smith, the attorney general. So the Natalie Wood story, whatever happened, and one reason to be suspicious of the entangling webs of the Metro Golden Mayor Combine and somebody from MGM Hotels being put on the board of Western is that there have been a series of articles, and I haven't gone into detail yet, about the discrepancies in her death, and I couldn't even begin to guess who or what or why, except several articles did say that she left the scene of a conflict of argument about politics. Christopher Walken, uh, her co-star in the movie she was making, and Robert Wagner, her husband, had a fight or an argument about politics. Now, that was from three different sources, but what it was or who they were talking about or where politics entered, I'm sure none of us will ever know, except that it was politics. They're, the person who found her is saying now that she appeared to struggle for hours in the dark, the person who took her body out of the water, that there were bruises on her body, that the ship that Wagner had was literally a drugstore with every kind of pill. It was a floating drugstore uh, that rigor mortis hadn't set in by the time they found her, that if she had been in there for hours, she would have been stiff by then. And she had a cut on her cheek. At 1.30, her husband called the Harbor uh, Reef and Saloon, a restaurant in Catalina, and asked the manager if he saw Natalie. Now, at 3.30, two hours later, the restaurant manager called the Private Harbor Patrol, and at 5.15, two hours after that, they went looking for her, and at 7.15, they, she was spotted by a helicopter. Um, she was found near that dinghy, that boat, and according to the experts who found her, when they both, if she goes over the side and the boat isn't attached, the boat floats according to the wind, and a body float is affected by the current. So they don't travel together, and yet she was just several hundred feet from the boat. Now, the, on the ship, according to these reports, 13 days before her death, she had had 28 Darvon, 29 Placidils. She used something called Synthroid. She had 13 Bactrim tablets. She took Dalmain for sleeping and Antivert for dizzy spells. And so that she had been drinking, she had Darvon and Cyclizone, C-Y-C-L-I-Z-I-N-E, Cyclizine. So that she was pretty much done in like Elvis Presley. She was overdosed and uh, evidently couldn't fend for herself under any circumstances, even if she hung on. Uh, she probably was meant not to survive with all of that. Um, the changes that I see in the newspaper just this last week are going over them recently um, in a chronological order from, say, December until February seem large. Um, 
this William French Smith representing Holden and Natalie and uh, Robert Wagner, rather, and Natalie, and the seven Rockwell officials, high officials, being killed in that one plane crash, and then the president of Rockwell uh, resigning a few d days later, just leaving, and the head of MGM Hotels being put on the board of Western. This is all in January. And in February, as I say, the President Rockwell leaves and MGM changes its head and Frank Rothman comes in with the law firm of Bowser and so forth. And then Henry Morgan of Morgan Stanley just died and he has a the controlling interest of Aetna Insurance that took over the studio 20th Century Fox where Robert Wagner works. So Robert Wagner is working under Marvin Davis with his connections to the Aetna Insurance, and she worked for MGM with the Kerkorian, Greg Bowser, Howard Hughes Empire uh, connections over there. And the middleman between uh, Natalie Wood and her husband Wagner is William French Smith, the attorney, the common denominator, the attorney general. And William French Smith is also the was represented Rockwell. That was one of his clients before he came the became the attorney general. Uh, those are a lot of names to throw out, but they have a uh, common thread running through them and in other broadcasts I'll go into more about it but the Fairchild changes the shifts in MGM change and the connections of of these various people uh, some of these stories we won't know I mean sure there, there's things behind the Natalie Wood story just as the Marilyn Monroe death whether she was in love with John Kennedy or Robert Kennedy or she knew too much about Jimmy Hoffa or Sam Giacana and the people who eventually were going to kill Kennedy the next year. Uh, she had to be done away with. We'll never really know because certainly the people involved aren't going to talk and there's a lot of speculation. But there's a lot of bases here with William French Smith and Rockwell and uh, being the attorney for Wagner, his office, law office, the attorney for uh, Wagner and Natalie Wood. Uh, there's an overlapping of names, insurance companies, studio ownership, shifting the ownership at 20th Century Fox, shifting the faces at MGM, moving the MGM hotels to the board of Western. Uh, a lot of activity going on of people who are involved with the highest echelons of the government uh, intelligence. It just makes uh, me wonder what is going on. It reminds me of the Continental Airlines last year. There was a effort by the Texas International Airlines to take over Continental Air Airlines that was uh, just in August of 1981 and then the president of Continental, Air Continental Airlines died quickly and mysteriously at his office there was a gun and again the Continental Airlines that was holding its own trying to fight Texas International at the time that Al Feldman the president was found dead owed money to the same Aetna life insurance and casualty that moved into 20th Century Fox and uh, then again, the name Aetna comes out in the Morgan obituary, in the Continental story, Chase Manhattan and, and Aetna insurance that Continental lenders owed money to. And the, at the time of the conflict of Continental trying to break even and hold its own through 1982, if it get another loan and stay on top, just at that time, the Continental chairman had what they call an apparent suicide is either a parent heart attack or an apparent suicide. There's a gun by his desk, some shots in him, and uh, uh, he was killed just at a time that he's fighting to hold on to his airline. So we really don't know too much about uh, these apparent deaths with Thomas Noguchi in charge of the autopsies in Los Angeles, and I do want to do quite a bit on Thomas Noguchi soon. It's very hard to tell who's murdered and what's justifiable. Uh, homicide, whether people are outright murdered or they actually did commit suicide. These suspicious deaths that are in the news have been proven to be covered up in Los Angeles. There's one case now where the heir, Deli Lily, Lily, is uh, being exhumed, the body. He was found dead in a hotel and they said it was natural causes, apparent natural causes, and then the family demanded that the body be exhumed, uh, which is going to be this week. Noguchi was involved 
with that autopsy, and he has a wife they call the Dragon Lady. The family said that she controlled his millions of dollars and wanted them, and she was a former secretary and advisor to Mayor Yorty, Sam Yorty in Los Angeles, who, again, is another political person, and the Eli Lilly Fortune from Indiana, uh, I believe Bloomington, the drug firm, was controlled by this man who was dead, buried at Forest Lawn, and now they're questioning that and they're exhuming that body. And speaking of that, uh, I just want to make a couple of comments on that airplane in Boston that we talked about a few weeks ago. Family of two men lost in the crash will sue the airline. This is from the San Jose Mercury, February the 2nd. The family of the father and son who were misplaced and presumed dead will file a lawsuit. Walter Metcalf, seven, and the son, Leo, who was 40 years old, were pitched out of the jet when it skidded at the runway in Boston. They were not reported missing for 72 hours. Members of the family went, and they said, go to the police, the missing persons bureau. There's n and the one article says there's no sign of the body, but remember the divers from the Coast Guard went down, saw a body, and didn't bring it up because they were told that the everyone was accounted for. Well, because of that, they're being sued for millions of dollars for the infliction of emotional distress and outrage as a result of what went on after the crash. They were listed at no show at the gate, that they didn't show up. Just the two people who didn't show up from New Jersey, they came in from Florida and picked up that World Airways flight that was coming in from Oakland to New Jersey and then up to Boston. And they asked the question, where in the system the Metcalf's names were misplaced? It's impossible to tell. When they said the weren't, bodies weren't found, they said, well, then there's no names. No other persons were similarly misplaced. And, of course, I mentioned once before, that has to be the biggest coincidence in the world, to misplace the name of two people to get through the gate and have those exact two people no trace of their body. Last week I just mentioned briefly, and I want to do some more on Michael Sedona and the Red Brigades and go to that uh, escape of great NATO officer Dozier. I think that whole thing was a disgusting setup, such as the SLA operation that went on here a few years ago in California. But I mentioned uh, several weeks ago Michael Sedona being charged with murder, and I mentioned David Kennedy, who was the Secretary of the Treasury under Richard Nixon, being indicted in New York for uh, $23 million missing from a bank in Milan. What I didn't know, and I got an article sent to me, for this is from 1974, the Wall Street Journal. At the time, the New York Franklin Bank Corporation that collapsed, a $45 million that Michael Sendona was responsible, another company called the New York Franklin New York Corporation, which was a parent of the Franklin National Bank, suffered losses of more than $60 million in the first five months. Franklin announced the election of Joseph Barr, a former U.S. Secretary of the Treasury, as chairman, president, and chief uh, executive of the bank and the holding company. Now, David Kennedy, the Secretary of the Treasury, was involved with Michael Sedona when the Franklin National Bank collapsed for $45 million. Then the Franklin New York Corporation, a parent of the Franklin National Bank, was missing $60 million. So they bring in, the uh, for a new management, the deputy under David Kennedy for the other company that was losing $60 million. That was a lot of money to be lost at one time. And, of course, uh, it's like the chicken being guarded by the fox again, the same old story. The uh, Secretary of the Treasury is involved in one operation with Michael Sendona and the mischief of missing millions of dollars out of Italy and also in the United States. They work closely with the Republican Party, but then a, another parent company to the Franklin National Bank was also missing $60 million. I wasn't so aware in 1974. It took me, I think, until about a year and a half ago or two years ago to begin to watch the missing millions. And some evening, I'll do just one entire broadcast on large amounts of money that are moving around, allegedly missing. And that's what I wonder when this fellow resigned from Fairchild, Mr. Dealey, really quickly, they were at least on the books missing a large amount of money, and they were a cover for the CIA, and one of their people did work from Australia. They used Fairchild as the cover for the Nugent Hand Bank, and maybe he quickly got out because... 
the pieces and threads of the Nugent Hand Bank have yet to be exposed, and we have to watch how this money floats around. And finally, we've got about a minute and a half. I have to go in detail in a few weeks on the penthouse trial going on. That's Jeff Gerth and Penthouse Magazine, who were uh, being sued by La Costa for uh, links that the penthouse wrote, or published, Jeff Gerth wrote that La Costa down near San Diego is linked to organized crime. Louis Neiser is representing Mo Dallas and La Costa, which is fitting. He was one of the attorneys that wrote an introduction to the Warren Report, and Mo Dallas had close connections to the crime figures and Robert Mayhew and the assassination teams involved with the Kennedy assassination. This is an interesting trial. Louis Neiser and the Mo Dallas and La Costa. Read your articles in the newspaper about the penthouse trial. Uh, Mo Dallas, according to the Los Angeles Times, admits ties to mob chieftains. That's one article. I have a whole lot of articles on the La Costa trial. And with Louis Neiser representing them, he also is the attorney that prosecuted the Rosenbergs, that works with Roy Cohn, a very controversial attorney representing the mob and the CIA. Well, we can't get into that now. There's not enough time, but I did want to cover some bases on these various names and people that I think have a interlocking relationship. If they seem complicated to you now, just as the names did at Watergate at the time, that started breaking out. And I keep referring back to that. They will become more familiar, I'm sure, in time. There are a lot of stories now that are all bursting at one time, and you have to keep track of, of them, some of these insurance companies, some of these changes, the heads of corporations, because they all have certain common denominators. So do your homework this week, read those papers, and I'll read mine, and I'll get back with you next week. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. This has been World Watchers International.